Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to talk about classical linear logic the way it was originally um, presented by Girard and then um, give uh, my way of reading that in terms of double negation interpretation. Um, there is something more to say I don't think I will get to today. Um, but using a double negation interpretation, one can actually validate more than just the original laws of classical linear logic. Intuitionistically, one can also do some other things. Um, and I, um, if I don't do it today, I will do it some, an, another time. So, um, OK, probably Wednesday. All right. OK, so my ability to explain classical linear logic is somewhat hampered by the fact that I'm an intuitionist. So you have to, you know, live with that. OK. Um, so what do we do? OK. So the connectives are mostly the ones that we're familiar with. Um, but the main judgment is going to be this, where a sigma is a, is a collection. You can say a multiset or whatever of propositions. OK, so unlike intuitionistic linear logic, where we have multiple things on the left and one thing on the right, in classical linear logic, everything is on the right. That's not necessarily forced, OK? So there's also other systems where we have things like uh, delta proves sigma. Um, but uh, this kind of formulation is seen as having a lot of redundancies. Um, and so generally, people working classical logic prefer this called one-sided formulation. OK. So um, a weird effect of this is that instead of left and right rule for all the connectives, you just have right rules and no left rules. Okay. Um, and the way you recover what we normally think of as left rule is by a notion of negation, which is built into the, form into the formulas. And it's a notion of negation that allow you to move the things that are on the left and put them on the right instead by negating them on the other side. Okay, And so we will be, have to be careful about this notion of negation as we go through if we want to understand how classical um, linear logic works. Okay, so, um, so let's just uh, think about, so in the identity rule, in the intuitionistic linear logic, looks like this. All right, so this is the identity rule. Um, okay, and so I can't exactly model that. Um, because I have to put everything on the right. But I know how to do that. So I'm just going to say A and the negation of A are contradictory. So the way we're going to write the negation is by this little symbol. I think usually it's pronounced perp. So this is A and A perp. Okay. Um, and so this gives, it gives me into the way I'm eventually going to interpret it. Eventually the way I'm going to interpret the um, classic linear logic is to say that um, we're trying to derive a contradiction, okay? And so you can think of A and A purpose being in contradiction, um, but uh, that's a little bit of a not precise analogy, as we will see, okay? So the cut rule over here um, is something like this. From delta, you prove A. Delta prime in A, you prove C. And therefore, by cut from delta, Delta prime you can see, so that's the cut. Okay. So now everything has to get shuffled around in this. Um, so the first sequence here is going to look like we have sigma and a. So we move that over here. Um, then here we have sigma prime. There's no need to distinguish the right hand side c because everything is moved anyway. So the c is basically put into sigma prime. So all we need is A on the left-hand side, but A on the left-hand side is being negated to prove it over onto the right-hand side. So that's just going to be A perp. Okay. And then I get sigma and sigma prime down here. Okay, so that would be the cut rule. This would be the identity rule. Okay. Um, okay. By the way, we have a visitor here today, Benjamino Akatoli, who was, uh, is giving a pop seminar this afternoon. And he has worked intensively in, in the classical and intuitionistic linear logic, proofs net, and so on. So he's there to stop me today if I make a mistake in presenting the classic linear logic. Okay. So far, am I doing okay? Okay. So far, so far, it seems to be all right. Okay. 
Um, okay, so that's just the, these are the, you know, um, judgmental rules or structural rules in the sense that they don't involve any particular connective, okay? And it seems pretty straightforward. Okay, so now we need to look at some of the other things. Um, and I'm not going to repeat the intuitionistic rules because we know them so well by now we don't have to. Um, so we have to ask ourselves if we are looking at um, A tensor B, how do we prove that? Well, normally we would say we split the context into delta and delta prime, and we prove A from delta prime, from delta and B from delta prime. Um, but here, because we have only one side, we would break it up sigma and A over here. And we have sigma prime and B over here. Right? So, um, so that makes sense. Um, okay, now we don't have a left rule, so what do we do next? Okay, so instead of defining a left rule, what we have to think about is, well, if you want to think about the cut and the way the local reductions work, okay, we need to define a perp somehow, and the somehow a perp has to be in such a way that we can reduce the cut that we want to reduce it, right? Okay. So rather than thinking about the left rule, think about how we negate things. That's equivalent to thinking about the left rule. Okay. And so the way we negate it is that we write something like, um, okay, so I actually am started like P perp. Okay, the negation of an atom is just written as the negation of the atom. There's nothing you can do. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to answer is how do you ne negate A tensor B? So what's the opposite of that? Okay. So now the strange thing is that the opposite of that does not exist in intuitionistic linear logic, okay? And it's written as A, okay, par B. So we pronounce this as par, okay? Which is supposed to suggest, I think, that they're in parallel somehow, okay? Um, and it turns out that this is actually connected um, in linear logic, intuitionistic linear logic with the arrow, okay? So to get, get, he, go ahead a little bit in the way we think about the negation of that, the negation of this is also, is, is gonna be similar, so it's gonna be um, A par, oops, B par, okay? Um, so um, the negation of the implication is gonna be this, which means that the implication itself Okay, is going to be equivalent to, some, in the, in the um, classical case, is going to be A perp par B, okay. So it's kind of like the classical notion of disjunction, okay, where we say A implies B if you have not A or B. So this par symbol could be read as some kind of disjunction, okay. But rather than the additive disjunction that we had before, this is a kind of a multiplicative disjunction in the sense that it's the opposite or the negation of the tensor, okay? Um, okay, so what does it actually, what does a rule for that look like? Does anybody have a guess? Hmm? Which rule? The rule for par. So we have figured out that well, we have kind of defined the negation of tensor to be par, right? And so these two have to be in harmony, right? So we should be able to figure out what the rule is for par now. Okay. It should be like the tensor left rule because we're moving the tensor from the left to the right hand side. So then it would be something like a par b and we just do this, okay. Um, Okay, so I guess um, we should check just, just once to make sure that we can apply an appropriate cut reduction, okay? If a, a, a proposition A tensor B meets its opposite, its negation, okay, uh, A par B. So this is the par and this is the tensor. So let's see what happens when, that, when we have that. So we have sigma one, sigma two, and A tensor B, which gives us sigma one, um, and A 
sigma 2 and b. And over here, we should have sigma prime. And the negation, which should be a perp par b perp, which comes from sigma prime a perp and b perp. And this is the, uh, and so we're cutting these two to get sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma prime. So this is the par rule, and this is the tensor rule. I don't have to say left or right, because there's only right rules in the classical case. OK, so how would I reduce that? I wanted to make sure that this definition of negation plus the rule for par really makes sense together. Yes, yeah, so we can cut this with this because we have an A here and an A perp here. So we get sigma 1 A and cut that with sigma prime A perp B perp and then we get sigma 1 sigma prime B perp, okay? And then then we cut it with this. And we get sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma prime, and the b disappears. OK. Um, OK. So those two rules mean, seem to make sense, and the par rule also seems to make sense. So the way we have to think about the things on the right-hand side, that it's sort of like a disjunction, um, but they're all linear, of course, which is unlike the ordinary, uh, the other disjunction that we have. OK, let's think about the, the units. What's the unit of tensor? Right. So that's 1. And it should only hold the only thing. Nothing else is there. So that's the rule for 1. OK. Um, now, we have to make up a negation of that. Uh, by the way, what's um, A par B par? Yeah. OK. So all these things have this, pro have this involutive property that if you take the negation of that, you get this. And if you take the negation of the result, you get that. OK, back. Yeah? Uh, can we say that the negation is involutive? Yeah. Uh, hmm? The negation of the negation of uh, atomic probability. Yeah. OK. So if we take this as a new symbol here, then if we take that symbol and we take the negation of that, we get the original one back. OK. Um, all right. So we need a unit for this one. OK. And this is also something that we haven't really had in, in the intuitionistic case, even though it is possible to give it a meaning in the intuitionistic logic. Um, so I might come to that at the end. It's, but it's a little different from the classical meaning. Um, so here, what we just have is that uh, one perp is called bottom. And of course, that means bottom perp is equal to one. Okay. And what would be the rule for that based on the, uh, the pattern that we have on the board? Okay. So it's like the one on the left, right? Because we're taking it from the left. So what does the one on the left rule, what the one left rule do? The one just goes away. The one goes away. And so here, it would just mean that the bottom goes away. That would be the bottom rule. OK. It just goes away. Um, and hopefully, these two things fit together. If we cut this premise here with this rule here, the conclusion should be sigma. 
Okay, and that's just the premise here, so the two work together. Okay, um, what else do we need? So we don't need implication because it doesn't have an in independent status. The implication is like a par and its negation is going to be like a tensor. Okay. Um, so the next thing we need to do is, I guess, with, so what would that look like? Okay, so normally we prove A with B, we take the whole context and move it to both premises. Okay, so what we do here, we we'll take the whole sigma to both sides, right? The withdrawal. Um, while we're at, what would be the unit of that? What is the top rule normally? Any context delta proves top. Okay. What would be the corresponding version here? Any sigma proves top, so that's the top rule. Okay. Um, of course, we need to now negate it. Now we need to see what the negation is. So what's the negation of A with B? Okay, we don't have many candidates. So either we don't have the log, we don't have the connective, or we have it already in the intuitionist case. Yeah. Uh, should yep, should be. The additive disjunction. Okay. So. Um, okay, so we have that. And we have the other rule. Okay. Which are just like the um, the intuitionistic rules, except that the sigma is here rather than on the left hand side. Okay? We should make sure that these things really are opposite of each other. So if you cut this with this, if this is a sigma prime, um, okay, so what happens? Um, so what happens is that if this rule was applied, then we cut this premise with this premise here. If this rule was applied, then we take that premise and cut it with this. And in each case, we get the sigma here with, or the sigma prime here with the sigma here, or the sigma prime here with the sigma over there. So the conclusion um, has a correct context. Okay. Um, there should also be a unit of that. Okay. Um, and we already know that that should be zero. Okay. What's the rule for zero here? Yeah. So there is no rule for zero on the right. Okay. So for the binary version, there's two. For the null version, there's none. Okay. Um, all right. So it seems to be going pretty well. Okay. Um, what's missing is, I guess, is um, bang. So the exponential. And there, the traditional formulation departs a little bit more uh, from what we're used to. OK. All right. So um, let's see. When, when should bang A be true? Which we're talking about on the right-hand side, right? So we have bang A. Okay, so let's think back to our our rule. Our rule looks like this. And this is our right rule for bang. Uh, these are the assumptions that are valid. Okay. Now, we didn't make that distinction because we have only one context, just the thing on the right-hand side. Okay. So we need to encode this whole context as a proposition or as a context here somehow, right? So how would we do that? Okay. So we would say, if we had two sides, we would say all the assumptions have to have a bang in front of them, right? Okay. Um, but we can't say all the assumptions have a bang in front of them because we have to move them to the other side. Okay. So what we have to put here is going to be some sigma, okay? 
but not an arbitrary sigma, but a sigma which comes from taking things which implicitly have a bang in front of them because they're validity assumptions and move them over to the right-hand side. Okay. And that's the role of, in intuition, this, or classical linear logic of question mark, which is also called why not. So of course A negated should be why not A negated like this. Okay. So the opposite of a question mark, the dual of that, uh, the, the exclamation mark is a question mark. The opposite of of course is why not, okay. And so usually this is written this way. Okay, and this is the bang rule, okay. Um, okay, so this has some problems if you try to give, um, if you try to uh, um, proof cut elimination, for example, um, and so on, because the kind of structural arguments that we have done so far that just go by induction over the structure of a derivation uh, won't work. Um, and also, if you do um, a curry hout isomorphism to get a lambda calculus for that kind of formulation, which we're still in the middle of when you have this kind of a rule, generally you get a problem with subject reduction when you try to prove that. Okay, And so the original sort of paper on a curry hout isomorphism that Bramsky wrote, he had, did have a calculus there that didn't satisfy um, a uh, substitution property. Okay, It doesn't, didn't satisfy subject reduction in general. Um, okay, but let's finish the first. Um, so this is one of the reasons to go with these uh, judgmentally, judgmental formulations in which um, we have a good explanation for the validity assumption and they're distinguished differently in the, at the level of judgments because you get something where you have both a structural proof of cut elimination just by structural induction and you also have um, you know, a lambda calculus that satisfies substitution properties which are very hard to get for these kind of formulations. But we're not done, okay. So what other things do we have for bang? Yeah? Yeah, we need rules for why not, okay. So, uh, so when is why not A true? Hmm? Sigma is empty, that's a pretty strong requirement. Okay, why would sigma have to be empty? Okay, so if you're trying to get an intuition about the, the why not A rule, let's put it on the left-hand side, right? What, what left rule do we have for bang? Okay, so what does the left rule for bang do? Right, so the left rule for bang that we have is gamma uh, delta comma bang A proof C if gamma comma a delta proof c, okay. So thinking about this though, the thing context in gamma, right, implicitly has a bang in front of everything. Um, and in fact, it's sort of like implicitly, once you put it on the right hand side, there's a question mark in front of it. So it's really unclear that this rule really does anything, okay, when we translate it. So what other rules do we have? The copy rule, okay. So that says if you have gamma and delta and we're trying to prove c, and then we can get a copy of A if A is in gamma, okay. So what would that correspond to if we try to translate this to work on the right-hand side? This is the copy word. Yeah? Um... No, because it's supposed that the why not, the gamma is moved here, but the a is also moved here, so we don't need a separate negation. So I would claim that it would be this rule. Okay, we just take a copy out, okay? At least one aspect of the rule is represented this way, right? So these are all, on the right-hand side, they have a question mark in front of them, right? And we take one of these and remove the question mark, okay? Right, right. There are other things we lose, but this should be okay to do that, right? 
So it's not invertible, right? So all, all the properties and so on that we have about invertibility, all these things change. And in fact, if you want to do a focusing system, you have to go to a different formulation of classical linear logic. Um, but I would claim that this is actually the, the correct rule that corresponds to that. Sometimes I think this is called dereliction because you get rid of one of the, um, the connectives. Okay, but it can't be all, right? Because there's another aspect to the copy rule, which is if we keep an extra copy of this around, right? Okay, and usually that's broken up into two, pro two rules, into two properties. One is that you can make a copy of something which is uh, in gamma, which when you turn it over has a question mark in front of it. And the other one is you can weaken it away because you don't have to use it at the end. Okay, so usually we have these uh, two rules. One would say, if you have that, you can get two copies of it, okay. And the other one would say, if you have it, then you can rid of it. So this is called weakening, and this is called contraction, okay. And this is, like I said, either you can think of it the question mark rule, or you can think of it as dereliction, um, if you want a separate name for it. So this is called contraction only because if you read it from the premise to the conclusion, you have two copies of question mark A and you contract them into one. And this is weakening because you have proved something without using that, and then you just add that. And it's okay because it has a question mark in front of it, which is the same property that had we had for things in gamma, right? We could weaken things in gamma. There's no problem, okay? We don't have a separate context, so we have to get the same information across by putting the question mark in front of it, okay? So unless I made a mistake here, which is entirely possible, um, I think we now have all the rules that we need for classical linear logic. Thumbs up. We're doing, I'm doing okay. Even though it's a very weird thing to pre pre present things, right? Okay. Hmm? Kind of unusual. Yeah, right, right. It's very unusual to give a lecture on linear logic and in the, in the 25th lecture, finally, we, we come to, uh, to these rules, okay. Um, but, okay. But at least I think I still got it right somehow. Okay, so this is the system we have. So we can uh, do some of these things. Okay. Um, okay, and now we can investigate properties of these things in their own right. And so actually, if you think about, um, uh, I mentioned several times Andreoli's original paper on focusing. Okay. So what he does actually in that paper is first he gives this kind of presentation of classical linear logic, um, which comes out of Girard's original paper. And then he gives what he calls a dyadic, he calls this the monadic system. And uh, monadic, not in the terms of monads the way we've been using it, but monadic because it has just a uniform zone on, this, on one side, okay, so there's basically just one place to write formulas. And then he gives what he calls a dyadic system, okay. And in the dyadic system, what we do is um, we actually have two things on the right-hand side, like this, okay. And so these are the things that are just plain, um, okay, you would say true. And these here have some kind of... Um, I would say possible, okay, from my perspective. But the, implicitly, these things have a question mark in front of them, okay. And then you can replace these four rules by the rules that you would expect if you know about the, the way that we have two contexts on the left-hand side, okay. So maybe you should just go through, um, so this is, this is Unreoli. Maybe we should go through this exercise just to make sure we understand how that works. Okay. Um, all right, so what kind of rules should we have in this kind of dyadic system where everything happens on the right, but we have a judgmental distinction between truth and possibility? Okay, so now we should be able to take the left rules for bang and we should make them right rules for question mark and it should be much more direct, right? Okay. So what should be the right rule for question mark now? I mean, everything is the right rule, but what would you rule for question mark in this system? Right. So we go from uh, sigma and we have question mark A 
and we have theta and we move it into there okay and we strip the, the question mark off right that corresponds exactly for going on the left hand side from bang A into A being in the valid context right we're just doing things on the right hand side instead Right. That's right. Because we're working on the other side of the turnstile, so everything is always like stronger becomes weaker. The first will be last, shall be last, and all this kind of thing. Okay. Okay. So that's so now. What other rules would we have? What would be the correspondence of the copy rule? Is that actually justified? Because the things in here are supposed to be weaker, and now we're making it true. Why is this justified? That's right. We have to remember that this is the right hand side of the turnstile, so we're talking about a proof obligation. Does this mean we can prove A true? And then it's okay if it's in here to have the, to prove the weaker thing that is just in here. Okay, so because we're working on the left-hand side of the turnstile, um, this is actually a valid rule. Okay. Um, on the right-hand side of the turnstile. Okay. Okay, and um, we keep the copy of A in here, which will take care of some of the other properties. Um, what would the identity rule look like now? Okay, so the identity rule is the place, one place where weakening gets encoded because we're allowed to keep the other assumptions around. Okay, so the fact that theta can be here is an encoding of the weakening rule. Essentially, what you do is you just postpone weakening, you never do it, you're never going to use that until you come to one of the identity rules and also maybe like here, it would be allowed to have another theta. Okay, um, so you postpone the weakening until the leaves of the proof. Okay. Um, Okay, and then Andrioli shows that these really, that these two judgments correspond essentially by taking sigma and theta corresponds to sigma and question mark theta in the original system. Okay. Um, he doesn't go the extra step and show that um, in this system now, um, you can prove a very, you can give a, in this system here, you can give a very structural proof of cut elimination just by structural induction. Um, so, and, uh, um, okay, and then from there he goes to what he calls the triadic system. And the triadic system is the one which we call the focusing system. Okay, so I'm not going to go through that, um, but just to note that focusing origin originated in the classical linear logic case and it's completely consistent with this kind of presentation of logic. Okay, um, okay. so that's classical linear logic. Okay, um, and uh, now I'm going to try to understand this from an intuitionist point of view, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to use the, the monadic system. Uh, okay, so I don't need this. I don't need the theta here. Okay. Okay, so this is where the so-called double negation interpretation comes in. So the way I'm going to try to think of this is that classical linear logic is like intuitionistic linear logic where you're trying to derive a contradiction. Okay, but this is already a well-known um, interpretation of classical logic and intuitionistic logic when you abstract away from the linearity. Okay, so a way that uh, a, an intuitionist can understand what the classical logician does is by 
reinterpreting what it does is just trying to find a contradiction. And that kind of explains why, at least in the ordinary case, a classical logic proof doesn't have constructive contents in general. The reason is because a proof of falsehood or proof of a contradiction doesn't have computational contents in general. And therefore, if you're trying to take a classical proof and reinterpret it as finding a contradiction, you can do that, but it doesn't give you a lot of information. So you lose that information that was present there. Okay. So Girard has argued that um, uh, linear logic, even the classical linear logic, is constructive in some sense because we can interpret directly into it the intuitionistic linear logic. Okay. Um, and so that's certainly true, and he actually gives that interpretation. Um, but uh, it still doesn't have the distinguished right-hand side, so it doesn't have that structural property that you want sometimes for talking about um, a distinguished conclusion. And it also makes it much harder to give a judgmental sort of uh, justification for all the rules the way I've tried to do it here. Okay. Um, okay. So. We're going to try to do this in what I call a parametric form, okay? So, okay. So we're going to try to say when we're trying to prove in classical linear logic sigma, okay, that corresponds to, okay, um, we give an interpretation of sigma uh, with respect to some p, and we're trying to prove p and we do that, oops, that symbol is not good here, okay, with a negation here. And what does a negation actually mean? Okay, so negation is actually parameterized by an atomic proposition. Okay, so this is classical, and this is intuitionistic linear logic. Okay, so what does not sub p mean? Not sub p of a is just defined to be a linear arrow p, okay. So the reason I'm doing this, there's a couple of reasons I'm doing this. One is that what I'd like it to define is something like A implies falsehood, okay? But A implies falsehood in intuitionistic linear logic. If I say A implies zero, that is incorrect because the zero has a, is a positive and it also has a, um, an additive flavor where all the other assumptions that, that you lose linearity kind of. So I don't want that, I want it to be precise. So what I would like to say at some level is A implies bottom. Okay, but at the moment I don't have bottom in intuitionistic linear logic. Okay, and so instead I define this kind of negation says from A I can prove P, where P is some arbitrary atomic proposition about which I know nothing else. Okay, um, and later on I'm going to exploit that because it turns out that there's a very general theorem you can pr prove about the translation. Um, and then you can exploit the fact that this is parametric in P and substitute things for P which aren't bottom, and they give you some more information about the nature of classical linear logic proofs. Okay. But in the simplest case, we'll just write it like this. And I'm not going to write negation sub P and sub P here everywhere, okay, um, because it, it's a lot to write, and P is fixed for the whole interpretation. So P never changes. It's just some special atom which doesn't occur in the original formula, and therefore I don't need to... Um, I don't need to keep writing it, okay. All right, so, um, so the question is, how do we define the interpretation of the context here so that this theorem holds that this is true if and only if this can be proven over there, okay. Um, okay, so uh, first I'm gonna do it for the purely linear case and I'm gonna come back to Bang later. And so the way to actually do this is somehow engineer this thing over here in order to make this true, right? So we look at the cases that would arise in the proof in order to see how we, could, how we might be able to make it true, okay? Um, let's see, what should we start with? Uh, okay, um, okay, let's think about atoms, okay? Um, so the question is how do we translate atoms? Now, atoms don't actually come into this at all, except um, if you use the identity rule to prove atoms, right? So here you have something like an atom P and P perpa contradictory, okay? So what would happen over here um, in the translation, okay? Um, anybody have a suggestion how to do this? 
So I would have two things on the left, right? Um, so how might I do this to get this to get this to work out? So so somehow you would think that an atom doesn't have any structure. So translating an atom, there's really not much you can do. You should get the same atom back over here, right? That seems like a plausible thing to do. Um, what about if you have to translate the negation of an atom? What do we do with that? Right, now we have to look at that rule over there. Or we can just form a hypothesis and see what it works out to. Yeah? Yeah. That we want something by which we can use our absolute P in order to derive that sort of implication for P2. Okay. So that's our form of negation. So I'm just going to write it like this, not P. Okay. So this purpose is just going to be translated as negation, which actually by definition is P arrow, the small P, the distinguished atom. Okay. So let's see what happens after the translation. Uh, if we take this sequence here, the initial. What we have to show over here is that the translation of P, which is capital P, the translation of this, which is P arrow small p, and we have to try to prove small p over here. Right? That's the translation of the sequent under this translation into this over here. Um, okay, P, yeah, we have to negate them. Sorry, I was going too quick. We have to negate them. So this would be P arrow P. And this would be P arrow P arrow P. And this would be P, right? Did I do it right this time? Why do we just negate them? Um, because we take the negation of the translation proves P. So there's one more negation in there. Okay. Um, and the reason I'm doing that, I could define the translation without this extra negation over here. But then the tensor wouldn't actually translate to anything like a tensor. It would have to translate to something that's dual over here. And if I translate like with, it would have to become an or. If I translate an or, it would have to become a with. So I want to keep the nature of the connective intact. So I said, let's put a negation in here. OK, can we prove that? I think we should be able to, right? Um, we just apply implies left on this. OK, and then we have to prove that over here, and we have to prove this over here. OK, and we can do that. So we can prove the result of the translation. OK, okay so that's not a proof that it works overall. In particular, it's not a proof of the if and only if, but at least gets us started. OK. All right. So there's actually a fairly common, um, fairly systematic way to think about this. Hopefully we can um, figure out like a lemma that will help us. Let's do, uh, let's do tensor. Tensors should be good. OK. Um, OK, so what do we need? So you want to somehow say um, the negation over here of the translation of a tensor B proves P. Okay. Um, now let's make a general observation about this negation over here and proving P. Oh, um, and the sigma and sigma prime are being translated. Not sigma, not sigma prime. Let me leave out the braces there just to make it easier to write. Okay. Um, is there a general observation we can make about the negation of something to prove P? So what does that look like? So the negation of A is A implies P, right? And we're trying to prove P on the right-hand side. And we have some other sigma, uh, translation of sigma lying around, okay? So we can always proceed improving this um, by focusing on this. 
That's, you know, there may be other possibilities, but one way is to do that. And then here we have from P proves P, which is identity. And over here we have to show A from sigma, right? Okay, so what will happen here is that if we take the translation of that, okay, um, okay, we can actually get it to be on the right-hand side if we want. Does that make sense? Okay, so what does... Does it suggest anything here for the interpretation of A tensor B? So this here, by the way, this is not A. Okay. So what we have to think about is that we want to be able to apply this rule, right? Um, I mean, this rule is applied, so we want to model the effect of that rule after the translation. If you put a negation here, okay, then we know we can move the translation of this formula to the right-hand side. Okay. So this is going to be provable if not sigma, not sigma prime, and we can prove A. Tensor B, the translation of that which we haven't specified yet, right? And then there is P implies P here, but that, okay. All right, so if you want to be able to find the right premise, what should this become? Well, it should be a tensor, right? Because the tensor right rule splits the context into two things. Okay, so what we know now is that, or what we conjecture, that the translation of A tensor B is indeed the tensor of two things, right? Okay. Um, because if you take, if you have two things here, then we can translate one, we can split this up, something goes here and something goes here. So um, the part that goes to the left here, this part here, is going to end up here we're going to do this right, it's going to be not, sig not translation of sigma proves the part that we don't know yet that goes over here, right? That's going to be the translation of A, okay, in some sense, or the part which goes to the left of the tensor that we generate here. So what should that thing be so that we get the translation of this premise over here? What should we have over here in this premise? Anybody see that? Unfortunately, I didn't leave myself enough room on the board. Okay. Right. So let's think about first, what do we want the premise to be overall when we're all done? What, does we, what do we want the first premise? It's not translation of sigma, um, not translation of A, Curves P, right? That's what we want this first premise to be. And the second premise we want to be not translation of sigma prime, not B curves P, right? Now we're at this point. We know that we have a tensor, or we conjecture we have a tensor. And then um, we have to put something here together with not sigma, such that we can then prove this. So what should we put here so that we can then prove this? Translation of A along with B. Right. It should be not translation of A. All in P, right? Makes sense? Because if you apply the implies left rule, then we put not translation of A into the context, and P ends up on the right-hand side. So what we're saying is that this thing here should end up on the left-hand side of the tensor, and then would be in good shape, right? Okay, now there's another way to write this. Not translation of A implies P. It's not not A. Not not translation of A, tensor, not not translation of B. Okay. So if you make this particular definition, then we know that 
This rule is going to be derived rule after translation. Okay. Okay. Um, this is why it's called the double negation translation, right? Because we have two negations in front of the subformula here. Okay. Um, in effect, if you do this in the intuitionistic case, and not in the linear case, but in the sort of unrestricted intuitionistic case, you can do the translation this way. You put a double negation in front of every subformula, and that's it. You don't need to do anything else. Okay. So it's very easy to describe the translation. Now, in the linear case, it's not clear that the exact same strategy will work. Okay. So we, we have to ch go through all the cases. And in fact, the translation that I have in this paper, which um, it's called the judgmental analysis of linear logic, where we, where we do this, our translation is different. And I think there's probably a good reason for that. So I suspect if you put double negations in front of every subform, you, you're not going to be able um, to prove this. But I'm not 100% sure anymore, because it was too long ago that we did that proof. OK, but maybe we'll discover it as we go through the proof and try to find some other things. Um, OK. All right. Um, what's the next thing we should do? Uh, um, I guess we should try to do the par, right? Which is a negation of that. So how do we translate? Um, so the question is, what's the interpretation of A par B? Okay. All right, so let's, again, if we take this sequence here, okay, and we do the translation, um, what do we get at the bottom? We get uh, the translation of negation of the translation of sigma, which I'll abbreviate again, and the translation of A par B, okay? And what do we want to eventually reduce it to is the translation of sigma and, uh, wait, I wrote this wrong, p on the right-hand side. So what we eventually want to reduce it to is this, the negation of the translation of A, the negation of the translation of B, and we try to prove p on the right-hand side. OK? That's what we're trying to We're trying to get, engineer the translation so that we can fill this gap, right? Because that's, this is a translation of the premise of this rule as a sequent, and this is a translation of that. Okay. And with that information, we should try to fill in this. OK, so what's the strategy that we want to employ here? Hmm? OK, so you have a, you want to write, Say it again. Tensor like this. Is that what you said? OK. Well, um, oh, sorry. I keep forgetting that because we're working on the left-hand side, we have to negate everything. OK, so that blows your suggestion out of the water. OK. Um, OK, so we have to modify this somehow. OK, well, maybe we could work the other direction. How could we get this? makes sense here that we should be able to use the tensor left rule. It also makes sense with our intuition because we, we designed the rules by the rules for par were designed to mimic the left rules for tensor. So now in the translation, we just have to arrange that somehow the tensor shows up on the left-hand side so that we can apply the left rule right, in order to mimic what happens before. So the question is, how do we get the tensor on the left-hand side here?
Hmm? Yeah, so we can do not sigma and we can get it over here. Right? Because that's just the implication right rule. Okay. And how do we get it to be here? Um, the lolly left rule for this, okay, um, which is this observation here, right? That if you make it A implies P, okay, which is the same as not A, then P proves P and we can prove A over here on the right hand side. Okay. So if we follow that, what we should get here is um, the double negation of that. Does it make sense? What we're doing here? So if this is a double negation of this thing, then by the lolly left rule, it becomes here with a single negation. Then we get it back over here, okay, by using the implication right rule. And then we use the tensor left rule and we're where we want it to be, okay. So there's also a double negation here, but it's on the very outside. Um, unless we made a mistake somewhere. Uh, I think there's a mistake somewhere. I think what happens is that if you, if you apply the lolly left rule, you get two negations here, but one of them comes from the translation of the sigmas. Okay. So I think it's just a single one here. Okay. Um, because if we if we, had, we need to make two negations in front of the, this here, one of them is already there, okay, and the other one comes from cholesterol. Okay, so there's one here, and then we have a tensor in here, okay. Um, by the way, it should always be, and this is part of the proof, which should always be the case that a formula is classically equivalent to its translation. Okay, so that's one half of the proof eventually is going to be that um, from the classical perspective, we're not doing anything, okay? So, that the, so the question, is, if we assume that for A, is it true for this translation here? Well, yeah, because the double negation of A should be equal to A, right? So these two things are actually classic equivalent because th if this is equivalent to A and this is equivalent to B, then the double negation of A should be equivalent to, the, um, to that A over here. And here, why are these two things equivalent? Well, if this is like a perp, right, then if you take a, a perp of a tensor, what does it become? It's a negation of a par, right? Those two, remember that thing that we wrote that A tensor B perp is A perp par B perp, the, the things are dual to each other in this way. And so if you think of this as being a perp here, we push it inside, this becomes a par, which is this one, this becomes not A perp and this is not B perp, okay? And that's the same as A and this is the same as B. And I'm not setting it up fully formally, but that's the intuition that we're not really doing anything different classically when we do. But intuitionistically, of course, they're very different. This has a whole bunch of implications with P or falsehood in them, and this over there is just a, a straight formula, okay? All right. Um, Okay, what else should we do? Uh, maybe we should do with. Okay, so um, we want to translate uh, sigma and A with, so not sigma and not translation of A with B. And what we expect to be up here is not sigma, not translation of A. And the other one would be not sigma, not translation of B, right? Um, and Okay, so if we want to engineer the translation of A with B, such that we can derive this rule in the target. 
Okay, which, which way do we want to start? Okay. Um. Uh. Um. A plus. That's weird. Not me. Okay. Okay. Style uh, not of A plus not of B. Okay, and then use the this principle here, right? And what do we get for the translation of A with B? Um, okay, so one of the new negations is being eaten up by that, so we should get, if we did it correctly, not, not translation of A plus uh, not translation of B. Did we do this correctly? Are these two classically equivalent? If, if this is a real negation? Yeah, because pushing the negation turns that into its dual. The dual of that will be with, and then the double negation here and double negation here cancel. Okay, so at least it's plausible. Um, Okay, so I think this is correct. There's another way to do it, I think. Um, instead of using the with left by using, a, instead of using a plus left, use a with right at some other point in time here, I think. Um, but, um, so when we do that, what we would do, we would use the implies right rule here to get not not A on the right hand side. You'd use it here to get not not B on the right hand side. And then we would use the and right rule to get not not a and not not b on the right hand side, um, and then we put it over on here on the on the other side. So the alternative would be, or would be not not translation of a with not not translation of b. Okay. So it it seems like from this little proof, both of these should work. Um, we able to follow this fast enough here? I guess you get the kind of the, the idea of what's going on with this kind of translation. So it seems like both of these should work. I actually haven't checked this here, this one here. Um, in the paper, we do it this way. Um, but okay. All right. So the tricky thing comes with the interpretation of bang. Okay, and. Um, um, I guess I'm running a little low of time. Um, so I, th okay, well, we can try it. I think it's worth thinking about explicitly what's going on there. Okay, so um, which rule should we try to model? Maybe we can try to model um, this rule because that's the one that's actually the bang right rule in some sense. So what happens here? So we have the translation of um, uh, question mark sigma, which is negated. And we have the translation of the negated translation of bang A. And we're trying to prove P. And from the premise, we have uh, not question mark sigma and not translation of A um, and we're still trying to prove P. So now we have to fill the bridge the gap between the two. Uh, 
OK, so how do we do this? So this is, by the way, now let's, let me be explicit about it. It's not the translation of, because we don't actually have a question mark in the image of our, in the image of our translation. So we need to realize that we're going to do a translation here. OK. All right. So, so how does this work? So we can approach it from the bottom a little bit, right? Um, we could get the thing over here by using this same trick here, right? We can get the bang, the translation of bang A to B on the right-hand side, OK? Um, okay. The problem is that we can't really use the, uh, uh, the bang right rule because we have the negation of the translation of the question mark sigma, which is in the way here, right? Because it's going to be there. These are all going to be implications with falsehood. So we can't apply the bang right rule, which is what we need to do to model that rule. So we can't do that here, right? So we need to get these things out of the way before we can do that. Um, and uh, so for that, we need to think about what's the translation of the why not, OK? So how could we possibly get these things out of the way? OK, if they ended up being bang something, then we could move them out of the way into the unrestricted context. Then we could do that, and then we could maybe copy them back. Okay. But they can't be bang because they're going to be negated. Okay. So how do we solve that? So we actually have to simultaneously think about the translation of bang A and the translation of why not A. OK, so if I want to take these things and be able to move them to the unrestricted context, what would they have to be? So if I take one of these assumptions, how can I get it onto the right-hand side? That's very easy, right? Just using the implication left rule. Because it's a negation anyway, right? So from there, I can make it onto the right-hand side. How can I get it back onto the left-hand side? <coughs> Well, it has to be a negation, right? So we have to start with not bang, right? In the translation of the question mark. So then we have, we have a not out here, and we have a question mark. Then we bring it on the other side, and the, the question mark here. It's going to be a negation on the right-hand side. Then we use implication right rule. Then we get a bang to the left-hand side. Are we OK so far? OK. Now we can apply the bang left rule to move into the unrestricted context. And what do we want to move into the unrestricted context? Um, well, it has to be something that's classically equivalent to that. So it has to be not translation of A. So we can use it on the right-hand side. OK. So question mark is going to be translated not bang not of A. Okay. So with that, before we even do anything with this bang A, we can go up here, and then we have in the unrestricted context of translation of sigma negated. In the unrestricted context, the only thing linear left is that. And on the right-hand side, we have P. Okay. So this is a bunch of steps here. Now we can move it over to the right-hand side, so we have not sigma. And this is empty now. And on the right-hand side, we have bang A. Okay. Uh, now we can use the bang right rule. And we get, um, if we make this a bang, okay. um, and then we get here over here whatever we need to put here in the body. So what should we put here so we can get all the way up to here? So unfortunately, I didn't leave enough room. I need one more thing in here. So this is going to be, hmm? 
Yeah, it's a double negation of a. So that with one more step, we can move into here. And so then we almost get this, except that we have moved all the unrestricted things into gamma, OK, into here. But then we can just essentially, we can just copy them back into the linear context, OK, by putting the question marks back, back on, OK. So you have to trust me on that. But what happens is we get this, OK? So this we need in order to be able to move it, the negation of that from the linear context to the unrestricted context. And this we need to go and apply the bang right rule at the right place. Okay. Um, and classically, of course, these are equivalent. In fact, classically, question mark, is the, the negation of that. So this law is one that you should expect. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm not going to go through more of the proof because I don't think it has a lot more information um, than what we actually went through here. And it's also it's written out in the paper in, uh, in quite a bit of detail. The crucial observation is this one here, that um, if you have not A and you're trying to prove P, you can apply implies left because the P proves the P. And then you have to prove A over here. Okay. So, and the other crucial observation is that any formula, it's classically equivalent to its translation. Okay, so on the classical side, we're actually really not doing anything. Um, okay, so um, so what we get out of that is is the theorem of this form. We can prove sigma in classical linear logic if and only if, from the negation of the translation of things in sigma, we can prove p. Okay, and it doesn't really um, P is some arbitrary new proposition. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that basically, if we had bottom in my conclusion, okay, then this not of P would be really a negation. And then I could really say that, okay, classical linear logic is just deriving a contradiction, okay, from the negation of the formulas. Okay. Um, and uh, so, there's other uses I want to put this translation to, but right now I just wanted to, to uh, bolster that claim. So I want to introduce um, bottom into intuitionistic linear logic. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll get rid of this stuff here. Okay, so I think I can do that in five minutes. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, how could I explain this, the meaning of this with the right rule? Any ideas? Okay, if I take this as a guide, but I don't have a sigma, what would that correspond to? Empty, Empty right hand side, yeah. Okay, there's nothing on the right hand side. Okay. Um, okay, but we have to always add ask the question, what happens is this on the left hand side? And what would correspond to that particular right row? Yes. Okay, well, we want to be able to cut these things, right? So we need to think about that as well. So nothing interesting is going on with the gamma, of course.
Hmm? Okay. Delta should go away. That's good. And what do we put here? Okay, let's see. If you put C there, then we have a problem because then there's something there. And the reason we erased the, the thing here is because we didn't. Yeah. Empty. Okay, so that. Okay. So remember the multiplicative rule for zero said, the rule for zero said we can have an arbitrary thing here and we can have a right hand side. Um, and therefore it was additive in that sense and it was the unit of plus, okay? And here we have this, require this to be empty, okay? And we also have to require the right-hand side to be empty, but we can do that now because we have these kind of sequence where we have nothing on the right-hand side. Okay, so then the conclusion should read this. Okay, can we prove that? Can we reduce this? Oh, so that's this one up here, so we lucked out, okay? So okay, anyway, so these left, this left rule and this right rule actually do match up. So actually, even though I didn't want to admit to it earlier, okay, there's nothing wrong with bottom, okay, in the intuitionistic case. You just have to be willing to say that we have an empty conclusion, okay, which is basically like saying we're trying to find some contradiction. Unlike zero, though, it's like um, we're trying to precisely use the resources to get this kind of a contradiction. With zero, we can abort anything, no matter what the resources are. With bottom, we have to be very precise. Okay, we have to exactly use up our resources. There's nothing. Okay. All right, so then we can instantiate this theorem that this can be proven if and only if this, which is if and only if, essentially, we get um, not translation of sigma um, proves bottom. And this is translation now that puts bottom into the places where we have a negation, okay. And this negation here, not A, is just defined to be A linearly implies bottom, okay. Uh, okay, so indeed classical linear logic is like trying to find a contradiction uh, from an assumption, okay. Um, at least under this interpretation it is. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do next time um, I'm going to go a little bit further in this. Um, and the way I'm going to go a little bit further in this is trying to be, um, first of all, I'm going to show that also question mark A, why not of A, is perfectly good intuitionistically. There's nothing wrong with that in intuitionistic logic, even though we have never been able to find many applications for that. Okay. But it's actually very closely related, related to um, uh, the monadic constructor, the, the lax modality that we had, but it's not quite the same. Okay, so lax truth and possibility are very, very similar, but not really, not quite the same. They're almost the same. Um, and then I'm going to exploit the parametricity of this translation here for something else besides bottom um, to give other interpretations to other variations of classical logic that have been proposed. And some of them are relevant to something we did at the very beginning of the class when we talked about um, the process interpretation of intuitionistic linear logic um, for session types. And so we'll revisit that a little bit um, and, uh, um, and show that there's some connection between what we did there, what we're doing here, and this kind of double negation translation. So that will be Wednesday. Questions? All right, so I guess I'll see you Wednesday.